one of the things that Maya and I found when we were writing this paper, we were looking at the discourse that precedes genocide in genocidal states. And the enhancement of a sense of victimization on the part of one of the groups, usually the group that's going to commit the genocide, first of all, their sense, as vi their sense of being victims is much heightened by the demagogues who are trying to stir up this sort of hatred. So they basically say, look, you've been oppressed in a variety of ways, and these are the people who did it, and they're not going to stop doing it, and this time we're going to get them before they get us. It's something like that. And so there's something very pathological about the enhancement of victimization, which is, well... <clears throat> See, that the problem as far as I, I'm concerned with it is, it's not, it's not thought through very well. Because there's, there's a point that's being made, and the point is that people have been oppressed and they suffer. And that's true, that point. But that's... But then, the proper framework from within which to interpret that, I believe, is that that's characteristic of life. You, you, you can't take it personally in some sense. And you can't divide the world neatly into perpetrators and victims. And you certainly can't divide the world neatly into perpetrators and victims and then assume that you're only in the victim class and then assume that that gives you certain, like, access to certain uh, forms of redress, let's say. It gets dangerous very rapidly if you do that sort of thing. So, for example, one of the things that characterized the Soviet Union, and this was particularly true in the 1920s, but, but afterwards, is so the, the Soviets were very much enamored of the idea of class guilt. So, for example, although it was only about 40 years previously that the serfs had been emancipated, they weren't much more than slaves, right? And so that was the bulk of the Russian population. They were bought and sold along with the land. So, they had been emancipated and, and some of them, many of them had turned into independent farmers and some of them had become reasonably prosperous because at least in principle, I, I presume a certain proportion of them from being crooked, but I presume a larger proportion from actually being able to raise food. And of course, at that time, the bulk of the Russian food population was produced by these relatively successful peasant farmers. And relatively successful would mean maybe they had a brick house or something, and maybe they had a couple of cows, and maybe they were able to hire a few people. And so, you know, it wasn't like they were massive landowners or anything. But I talked to you a little bit about the Pareto principle and the notion that in any domain of activity, a small proportion of people end up producing most of what's in that domain of activity. The same was true in Russia with regards to these peasant farmers. Some of them were extraordinarily efficient, and they produced most of Russia's food. When the communists came in, they described those, those landholders as parasites, essentially, predicated on the Marxist idea that if someone had extracted profit from an enterprise, that they had basically stolen that profit from, from, from the people, say, that they had employed or otherwise oppressed. And so you could be a member of the Kulak, K-U-L-A-K, K-U-L-A-K, you could be a member of the Kulak class. And then because you were a member of that class, you were automatically guilty. And so what happened was, and you've got to think this through to really understand what happened. So, what happened was the intellectual communists were sent out in cadres out into these little towns to find people who would help them round up the kulaks. Now you've got to think about what a small town is like, because so imagine you're in a town and there's three or four people or maybe ten people or something like that who are a little more successful than everyone else. And a certain number of people are going to be fine with that and maybe even happy about it because they regard those people as particularly productive and you know as stalwart members of the community regardless of their flaws but there's going to be some people who are not happy about it at all that are going to be very resentful about that and jealous and so those are going to be people whose characters I would say are of the less positive type and so when the intellectuals came in and described the reason that these people should be treated as parasites and profiteers then it was the resentful minority in those towns and that would be the kind of guy that hangs around in the bar all the time and is completely unconscientious and fails at everything and then blames everyone else for it the intellectuals came in and said here's this is unfair that this happened to you you've actually been victimized and now it's your opportunity to go have your revenge and so that's exactly what happened now 
in some of the villages, some, sometimes the peasants would actually surround the, 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 the farmsteads of these more successful people and try to defend them, but that never worked out for very long. And so then these mobs, these angry mobs would go into the farmhouses and strip the place right down to nothing. And they packed these people up and sent them on trains with no food at, out to Siberia where there was no place to live. And so that they were packed into houses, you know, maybe they had a square meter each to live in and all their children died of typhoid and, and, and many of them froze to death. Many, many people died, millions of people died as a consequence of the dekulakization. At least in, in, as a consequence of its total effect. So what happened then was that uh, th there wasn't any food produced. And so then six million Ukrainians starved to death in the 1920s. Which is something you never hear about, right? You never hear about that. Why do you never hear about that? That's a question worth asking. You know, it was an absolute catastrophe. They used to, so these people were starving. Right to the point of cannibalism, right? I mean, it was ugly. As ugly as anything you could possibly imagine. If you were a mother, and, and so you're supposed to hand all your grain into the central committee, mostly for distribution into the cities. You didn't get to keep any for yourself. And so maybe then afterwards, if you were a mother, you'd go out in the fields that had already been uh, harvested, and you'd pick up individual grains of wheat, and if you didn't turn those in, they'd sh that was death for you. So that's how far it was pushed. So, well, so that's a little story about how victimization, how the idea of victimization and, and perpetration can get out of hand extraordinarily rapidly. And so whenever people are beating the victim drum, you know, they'll cover that up with, with uh, empathy, roughly speaking. We're speaking on behalf of the oppressed. It's like, maybe you are, but maybe you're no saint because, you know, you're so sure that you're a saint and you're only speaking from a, the position of good. It's highly unlikely.